What a wonderful time of worship this morning. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Uh, I'm putting the songbook down right here in case I forget to put it back where it belongs. Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. It is a wonderful time to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It is wonderful. Well, let me not belabor the point. I am trying to shorten my sermons for you folks. Today, I'm going to make that effort. I don't know if I'll succeed because I've been trying for a while. But I'm working on it. I just want you to know. I'm working on it. Ah, the Lord would use such a flawed and broken old dude like me to do this is just more proof that he has a sense of humor, don't you think? Praise the Lord Almighty. The truth on trial this morning. We're going to do today a little bit like what we've done in the past few weeks, where we are going to be asking ourselves... We're asking Scripture the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions. And, as we've learned in One on One with God about meditating on Scripture, we ponder, picture, and pray about what Scripture is telling us. And this passage of Scripture, a brief little passage of Scripture, that is extremely familiar to all of us who have been around church and reading our Bibles for any period of time. But I want, if I can, to entice you to put yourself in this picture today. Are you ready? Are you ready to put yourself in this picture? All right, let's get into it. As always, you are invited to read this aloud with me. You do not have to, but you are invited to do so. And Caleb, like in recent weeks, when we get to the bottom of this, I'm going to ask you to put it back to the first verse so I can do as I have typically done, work through explaining these verses as much as is necessary. Okay, let's go. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. Therefore, Pilate came out to them and said, What accusation are you bringing against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This happened so that the word of Jesus, which he said, indicating what kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Therefore, Pilate entered the praetorium again and summoned Jesus and said to him, You are the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Your or did others say about me? Jesus answered, the Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest, what have you done? I'm going to try to get back in sync with you here in a minute. I got no rhythm, people, no rhythm. <laughs> Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born. And for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Everyone who is of the truth 
listens to the voice of Jesus. Next verse. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after saying this, he came out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no grounds at all for charges in his case. However, you have a custom that I release one prisoner for you at the Passover. Therefore, do you wish the king of the Jews? So they shouted again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a rebel. Okay. Thank you, Caleb. <clears throat> wow. There is so much backstory to this. <laughs> So much backstory. And if you ask my wife, she will tell you, and you've seen it yourself, I have a hard time figuring out what to leave in and what to leave out. The line of an old Bob Seger song, by the way, for those of us who are of a certain age. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. John has skipped over the trial before Caiaphas. But I want to read that part to you because it's relevant here. And while we're going through, I want to ask you a question. And I want you to think about this question. Who and what do you believe? The truth or something other? The truth or lies? Truth or error? God or the world? The word of God or the word of man? A lot of questions there. They're all the same question, aren't they? So let me read to you from Mark chapter 14, verse 53, 53 through 65. They led Jesus away to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes gathered together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest and was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the entire council were trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many people were giving false testimony against him, and so their testimonies were not consistent. You notice how the lies are often inconsistent. Liars have a hard time getting their stories straight. That happens a lot happens a lot. And then some stood up and began giving false testimony against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that was made by hands. In, in three days, I will build another made without hands. And not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. And then the high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, do you not offer any answer for what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer, did not offer an answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? A very pointed question. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, listen closely, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. If that doesn't give you goosebumps, you do not understand the words I am reading to you. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him as deserving of death. 
And some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and say, Prophesy! Then the officers took custody of him and slapped him in the face. It just takes my breath away when I think of that scene. So we get back to our focal passage. Now the Jews didn't want to go into the palace of a Gentile. They would have been defiled according to their rules, would they, and they would have been prevented from participating in the rest of, for sake of jumping to the quick here and not giving you the nitty-gritty details, for the rest of the Passover celebration. Here they were intent on murdering the Son of God, but they didn't want to be defiled according to their own scruples, their own rules, so that they could participate in the Passover. You see, this is the difference between lies and truth. This is the difference between true worship and going through the motion. They were described by Jesus himself as whitewashed tombs. All nice and clean and white on the outside, looking good on the outside, but on the inside, full of dead men's bones. This is a classic example. You know, interestingly enough, they're so, they're paying such close attention to these minute rules. These rules that they're adhering to here, to not go into the, the, a building belonging to a Gentile to remain clean, not in the Bible, not in the Old Testament. They had set up hundreds of rules, written hundreds of rules, that's not in Scripture at all. They had, were, in fact, in essence, they had made, they had, from the foundation of the Word of God, they had made a completely different religion, having little or nothing to do with the spirit of truth. Little or nothing to do with the spirit of truth. Now think about that. Do you think it's possible that in our day there are religious teachers and preachers and organizations doing the same thing? I'm here to tell you there are. Lots and lots of them. Now, we're all human beings. None of us is perfect. There was only one perfect man that walked the face of the earth, himself, Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to quibble over little things. But this was clearly so far out of the, the truth, it's not even funny. So let me not belabor the point any further. Therefore, Pilate came out to them and said, what accusation are you bringing against this man? Pilate, do you know Pilate? How many times have we heard this name, Pilate? Pilate had a pretty nasty history with the Jews, and I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but basically, Pilate hated the Jews. He was put in charge of this area by the Roman government, probably because of who he married. He married somebody that was connected, and uh, the, you know, the daughter of somebody that was, <clears throat> that was very powerful. And in essence, he was given this rule that most other leaders and governors in, under the Roman government didn't want. Why? Because the Jews were very hard to govern. Can you imagine that? God's chosen people were hard to govern. Had that ever happened in the Old Testament under God himself or under their own kings or under their own judges? <laughs> yeah. They had a long history of being hard to govern. Let me ask you, are you hard to govern? Is it hard for you to obey in doing what it is that you know to be right? Stop and think about that. So before we get all judgy, how about us? Are we really any better than them? Really? Just a thought. I'm not throwing swords, slings, and arrows here. You know my testimony. I'm lucky to be alive. 
from my own foolishness and stupidity that came co close to killing me more than once by the grace of God. So, Pilate is just doing what he has to, what he's actually doing his job here. But he's got a long history. The Jews hate him. He hates the Jews. And the fact of the matter is that Pilate, with this long history, the Jews have gone to the Roman government multiple times, and they've got him sort of teetering because they've gotten him, shall we say, reprimanded a number of times. Pilate is literally in fear of losing his job at this point. In case you're wondering how in the world he can say repeatedly, as you'll see, I see no fault in this man, and still end up sending him out to be executed because he was being pushed around. All of the powers that be made him comply in order to keep his job. Next verse. They answered and said to him, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Okay, so what did he just ask him in the last verse? What accusation are you bringing against this man? Here's his answer. If this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. Okay? They're not even answering the question. They're evading the question. Because why? The Romans don't care about their blasphemy. The Romans don't care. Now, it's not in this passage of Scripture, but it's clear as we get further in that they did say more than this, and when we get there, I'll tell you. So Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Can't you just hear the disdain in that? The Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. Oh, who said anything about death until now? Okay, once again, they reveal their, they reveal their cards. They reveal their intentions. They have been intending to kill him. And if you go back, you've been with me going through the Gospel of John, you know full well they have been seeking to kill Jesus for a long time. Now, next verse. This happened so that the word of Jesus, which he said, indicating what kind of death, what kind of death. Well, Jesus had said, in Matthew 20, verse 19, Jesus predicted he would be delivered to the Gentiles to be killed. And the Jews were doing that very thing. In many places, the Lord said he would be lifted up. In John 3, John 8, John 12, he said, and this was referring to crucifixion. The Jews used stoning in their capital cases. They wouldn't lift someone up. They would throw them down and bash their head in with stone. They would kill them by stoning them to death. So to be killed under the Jewish rules would not have fulfilled Scripture, would not have fulfilled prophecy. And that goes all the way back to the snake on the pole in the desert. Remember that back in the Old Testament? All they had to do was look on the snake and believe, okay? This bronze snake. So, now here's the, here's the ironic thing. The Jews played a role in this themselves, you know. Maybe you haven't heard this before. I don't think I'm inventing anything new. But the Roman action ensured, the de ensured death by crucifixion. And the Jews themselves wanted him crucified. Why? Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21 basically said, he was hanged on a tree as a curse of God. To make it short, they did this intentionally, missing all the rest of the prophecies. You understand? Once they saw that, they went, aha, we have it. This way, he will be absolutely discredited in the eyes of God and all of God's chosen people of the Abrahamic covenant. He is cursed and cannot possibly be the Messiah. And somehow, because they were so focused in perpetrating a lie and making it look like the truth, they didn't see the very truth that they in, were playing a role in fulfilling prophecy themselves. You see that? You know the old saying, oh, what a tangled web we weave if at first we what? That's right. That's right. So, 
Truth or lies? Light or darkness? The world's view or God's view? Who is right all the time? There you go. Verse 33, Pilate entered the praetorium again and summoned Jesus and said to him, What? You are the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this? Or are you on your own? Or did, you, did others tell you about me? It's kind of a weird answer, don't you think? What was Jesus getting to? Well, just like in the modern trial system, hearsay is not allowed in a trial. Hearsay is not allowed. Jesus is saying to him, is this hearsay? Now, Pilate, being the cynic that he is, doesn't directly answer the question because, in fact, it is hearsay. This trial, like all the rest of these six phases of this trial that Jesus goes through in this very brief period of time, is a sham. It's not real. But it does so much to show us who Christ is and who the world is. Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Simple question, right? Well, Jesus comes around, and <laughs> Jesus isn't exactly playing by Pilate's rules himself. Jesus knows this is a sham. So he says, remember he asked about the king of the Jews? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. If you are in Christ, this world is not your home. If you are in Christ, this world is not your home. If you are fully invested in this world and not in the next world, you're going to lose it all. Forever and ever and ever. Amen. You will lose it all. If you are not laying up treasures in heaven, where are you putting your, your treasures? Where are they going? Where are you investing your time and your money and your energy? So Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. All of that is a short way of, a longer way of saying, I am not a rebel looking to bring down the Roman government. And he was not. He is also not saying that he doesn't have authority over this world, because he does. He says later on in Matthew 28, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. So he, it's just that his mission at this point in time in the, of Scripture that we're looking at is not what he's here. He's here the first time as the suffering servant, as the lamb, the sacrificial lamb of God. 37, therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born, and for this I have come into the world. Look at that sentence with me again. For this purpose I have been born. He became a human being. But what else? And for this I have come into the world. That speaks of his pre-existence. Anyone, any false religion that tells you that before Jesus was born into a human body, he did not exist, is not interpreting Scripture as it should be interpreted. And there are lots of people doing that. Do not be misled. Are you going to believe the truth or lies? Are you going to believe God, or are you going to believe the world? Are you going to believe the Word of God? In this case, it's my tablet here today. 
Are you going to believe what's on CNN, CNN and MSNBC? And OK, we'll go to the other side of the aisle, Fox News, or any of the others. Whatever newspaper, whatever source, who are you going to believe? If you want the pure, unadulterated, unadulterated, pure truth, where are you going to find it? Where are you going to find it? So he says, you say correctly. I've come into the world. Why? Why did he come into the world? To testify to the truth. Truth. Remember the title of this, The Truth on Trial. To testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Do you listen to the voice of Christ? He says if you don't listen to the voice of Christ, you're not of the truth, which means you are into the kingdom of lies. The father of lies is your Lord. He is not your Savior, because he comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. He has no love for anything but his own glory. That's it. You know, that's when we are most like him, when we are selfish, self-centered. When we say, but enough about me, what do you think of me? When he spoke of, I will set my kingdom above the throne, me, me, I, I, me, me, I, I. If you are selfish and self-centered and it's all about you, you're not listening to Christ. Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? After saying this, he came out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no grounds at all for charges in this case, in his case. Okay? I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because I'm dragging. I have, I'm not keeping with my plan of keeping it short. My apologies. Practice makes perfect. Hopefully soon I will get this. I have a sheet of paper here I'm going to read from that if any of you want copies, actually it's two pages. I'm not going to read the whole thing, I promise. But I want to give you an indication. What is truth? This is from the Dictionary of Bible Themes. You can look it up online. Dictionary of Bible Themes Scripture Index. To call the Lord the true God means that he alone has in his being the fullness of deity and is worthy to be worshipped as God. Did you hear that? He and his word are a trustworthy foundation for life because he speaks the truth and is utterly reliable and consistent in his character, his revelation of himself, his promises, and his pronouncements. In Scripture, there are titles reflecting God's truthfulness. The true God in 2 Corinthians 15, Jeremiah 10, 1 Thessalonians 1. The God of truth in Psalms 31 and Isaiah 65. Jesus Christ is the truth in John 14, 6. And also John 1 and 14 and 17 and John 6. Jesus Christ calls himself the true bread, meaning that he is real, substantial, reliable, and life-giving in 1 John 5 and Revelation 3, the true bread. We're going to be doing the Lord's Supper, including bread, symbolic of that. Okay? The spirit of truth. We've spoken of that a few times here before, haven't we? John 14, John 15, John 16, 1 John 4, 1 John 5. Okay? I know that this isn't particularly riveting reading to you, but I want to make the case absolutely as solid as can be made. If you want to know truth, it's in the Word of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father but by me. And it says in God's Word, no one comes unto Christ except the Father draws him. Okay? There's a divine conspiracy going on, to name a famous book by Dallas Willard. And what a wonderful divine conspiracy it is. And the Holy Spirit is in there too. God is true to his character, the spirit of truth. He speaks the truth, Isaiah 45. Also, 
in 7, in Psalm 33, in Psalm 119, in John 17, in Revelation 21, in Revelation 22. He does not lie in Numbers 23, also Romans 3, 1 Timothy 2, Titus 1, Hebrews 6, 18. He is true to himself and his promises, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 25, Psalm... I can go on, okay? The point is, if you want to know the truth, you've got to be in the Word of God. The less time you spend in the Word of God, the more prone you are to believe the lies of the world. The less time you spend getting the Word of God to become part of you. I'm not talking about a quick perusal. That's a good start. Ponder. Picture. Pray. Meditate on God's Word. Spend time in it, thinking about it. What does it mean? What does it say? What does it mean? And what does it mean to me in this life? What does it mean? Okay, I'm getting ready to close. I'm not going to make my mark today, but I'm going to do better than I could. See if I can bring it up here. From an article that I want to mention here, and you can look it up online, it's from Grand Canyon University. Dear Theophilus, why is absolute truth crucial? Why is absolute truth crucial? It's written to the faculty of the College of Theology at Grand Canyon University. The author is Mark Kreitzer. Why is absolute truth necessary for life? Or is it? Well, this is an awesome question that has actually been discussed for millennia. Pontius Pilate asked a similar question after Jesus prompted him by saying that he came to testify to the truth. And anyone on the side of truth listened to him. A couple of weeks earlier when the disciples asked him to show them the way, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. Not the law, which the Jews thought was the way, ultimate truth and life, as in Romans 2:20. Jesus meant that the truth was not merely some abstract thing floating out in space that we have to mystically experience or something we have to force our will to follow, but it was a person. It was a person. Himself. It was a person. Himself. I shouldn't have looked up from the page. I can't find my place. <laughs> in Christ, Paul adds... All the riches of the Godhead dwells bodily, and in him also all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Paul's desire was that the Colossians would not be deceived by fine-sounding philosophical arguments, Colossians chapter 2, but that believers would find all truth in Christ. Truth is thus not abstract, empty philosophical reasoning, and depends on human teaching and elemental spiritual forces, but a person. Jesus Christ. All philosophy tends to think that truth is merely and only abstract propositions. Kind of hard to get your hands on abstract propositions, isn't it? Kind of hard to plant your feet on abstract propositions. You know, it has been said, and I forget who said it, that moral relativists have their feet firmly planted in midair. And that is true. But this doesn't answer Pilate's question. Let's go straight to it. Where does absolute truth come from and who gives truth? Paul says, every truthful thing in the universe is found in Christ as the word, wisdom, and knowledge belonging to God himself. When we neglect him, we have no real truth and nothing ultimately makes sense. Now let me close by leaving you with a simple thought. Wars have been won by the intentional planting of disinformation. The United States is still a free nation and not singing, not raising a hand and saying Heil Hitler because of deception that we used against the enemy during the war. Do you know that? If you think 
that our enemy, the enemy of our souls, has not filled the world with deceptions. He doesn't have to tell you the exact opposite of the truth. For you to miss the mark down the long lane of eternity, or even just a year or two of your life, all he has to do is convince you that it's not that way, it's that way. You understand? You can be almost there and still miss the target. If you want to know the truth and make sure that your arrow, your life, your eternal destiny is going the exact way it needs to go in order for you to get through that narrow little road that Scripture speaks of. If you want to be certain that you are on the narrow path, and walking in the truth, in spirit and in the truth, it's in the Word of God. It's readily available to you. You can pay for it, you can borrow it, you can steal it, you can get it for free online, it's all over the place. If you want to know the truth, it's there for you to know. But here's the catch. You have to believe it. What does that mean? Believe it. It means you have to put your faith and trust in him who is the truth. In Christ. Apart from him. Apart from him you can do nothing. He is the very living embodiment of the truth. He is the exact image of the heavenly father. Apart from him you will never see heaven. And if you continue, even in little ways, to veer from the truth, you are doing your own self-harm and everyone who loves you harm. Know the truth. Jesus said what? If you abide in my word, how did he describe the word? Thy word is truth. If you're in the word and you trust it, you believe it, you make it part of your life, He said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And what? The truth will make you free. Free from what? Free from what? Free from the snare of lies. You will believe lies because we are surrounded by them. We are immersed in them. They're coming at us all the time. And there is but one lifeline of truth. Jesus, the living word of God, the logos, and the Bible, the rhema word of God. And apart from that, you have no lifeline. And you are awash in a vast ocean of lies and deceptions. My point is made. It's time for me to shut my pie hole. Have I made it clear? Can I get an amen? Amen. If you're not feeding on the word of God daily, what are you feeding on? If you're not reading the word of God, what are you reading? If you're not listening to the word of God, what are you listening to? What are you spending your time investing in? The world and its way or God and his way? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness, your truthfulness. Thank you for your ongoing patience, your ongoing trust, that is faith, that is that you are always worthy of our worship and praise because you are always right. You are the very standard of rightness. And any time we are anything other than zeroed in on you and your truth with our eyes upon Jesus, we are not on the path. Help us, Lord, to remember our GPS, God's positioning system. In his name we pray. Amen.